So uh, yesterday we heard about the ecological uh, sustainability side in our case examples, and today our Creative Nets planning officer from um, Taike, Will Milla Minerva Mertanen, will lead us through the case examples of a different kind of angle on sustainability. So, Milla, please. Thank you, Sofia. Okay, good morning, everyone. How are we today? Woohoo! Woohoo! That was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Semi okay. Okay, uh, today we are able to hear two inspiring stories about sustainability and uh, a foundation of sustainability from cultural and social perspectives. Uh, what different aspects of sustainability do we recognize and how do we strengthen the perspective of sustainability? Yesterday, we tried a new way to do these case sessions. I think for me it was a new way. Uh, so, as an audience, you are able to join the conversation during the presentations. How are you going to do that? Use your mobile phone and go to the webpage menti.com. And I can't see the code number now. But over there you can use the QR code. And the code number is, sorry, I have to move. <laughs> it is 4577171. And, and this window will be open during the presentation, so you can leave your comments, opinions, and questions for the presenters. Okay, but now. Our first specialist of this case sessions is Sofia Alexanders. Sofia Alexanderson is the chief executive and artistic director of Share Music and Performing Arts. Alexanderson has extensive experience of inclusive arts and comprehensive experience as a project leader of both national and international projects. She has lead project workshops and held lectures in several countries on empower, empower, uh, empowering disabled people through the arts to be visible in the society and show their potential. Where wa Let's welcome Sofia. Good morning, everyone. It's really good to be here. So thanks a lot for the invitation to come here to Ulo. So yes, I'm going to present chair music and performing arts and what we are doing in the context of what we're talking here about today. But just um, as a way of introducing you to our work, I will give you a little bit of a background first to what we are doing and uh, so you understand uh, why we are doing, what we are doing and how. So chair music started more than uh, 20 years ago in Sweden and in the UK it started uh, like back in the mid 80s and uh, my background is as a musician so I came across this work um, through someone who just said Sophia you should go and do this kind of work so the basic idea from the beginning was really to offer opportunities for disabled people to do the arts and uh, so during the first 10 years we uh, conducted a lot of short courses for people around Sweden uh, but since 2017 we have have been on a very interesting journey so today we have been transformed into a knowledge center with a specific focus on inclusion and artistic development. I think it's essential uh, here, oh this one is not working now, well let's do like this. Now Yes, here we go. We're talking about sustainability, so I think we should start here with the Agenda 2030. Leave No One Behind is the part where you and really have been focusing on inclusion of disabled people. I hope you all are familiar with the Agenda 2030. So we are in particular working with these uh, goals. 
Number four, which is about uh, getting good opportunities in education. Uh, go number eight, which for us is really about uh, access to work. And we are talking about access in the form of offering the same opportunities for disabled people to both get good education, opportunities to work in the arts field, and also, of course, go number 10, which is about reduced inequality. But since quite recently, we're also working with go number 11, which is really about the last bit, I will say, which is for us, because it's about sustainability <clears throat> and sustainable cities. And for us, it's really about how do we get access? How do we talk about um, the societal change we need to do? Also, what is in between buildings? <clears throat> Uh, we are a human rights based organization and we do that work in many ways. In this photo you see our uh, performance at my convention which is a performance for children by children about their own convention and it's a work we have been doing together with a theatre in Armenia uh, and it's almost a speechless um, performance which is really just describing offering opportunities to deal with the human rights. But we're also working a lot with different institutions. We did an opera together with Gothenburg Opera, uh, together with a Danish uh, composer, Lina Chernhoi, which was really about exploring new ways of finding new artists and also new ways, what kind of voices are allowed to be on stage. Here is our ensemble Elefantara, which I would like to dig a little bit deeper into. It's a very unique ensemble. They started on a factory floor in South Sweden. Uh, we were doing a, an artistic uh, residency and um, in the area where we are, we have lots of factories, lots of industries. And we were working together with a composer, Karen Power from Ireland. And she's a sound artist and she's going all around the world recording. So we thought, okay, where shall we go in our area? We should go to a factory. So we happened to get introduced to a big factory owner. They are doing the hangers, you know, the metal parts on, it's called hang on the factory. It's huge and they are very big. So the owner said, well, hello, you're most welcome and you can come here. So we came there to record and uh, to really find new ways of uh, getting material. And in the end, the result was a piece called Machine Shutter, uh, where the tape is based on the machine sounds and they explore this. And the piece is for iPads, uh, cello, piano and percussion. And it was really interesting when we came back to the factory to actually play for the whole um, workplace. Uh, this is a very uh, unique piece. And so this was a starting point for this ensemble. They were quite brave because we said, yes, we want to use digital instruments because that has always been a very strong part of our work. And we have been very interested in the, uh, the form of ensemble. So in this photo you see the ensemble Musica Vita, which is an orchestra, symphony orchestra in, in the south part of Sweden, and you can see two iPad players. So what is actually happening when you put two iPad players in a string orchestra? And especially if you put musicians who are not having the same background, the same experience as all other uh, musicians. Well, we did a lab where we were using the composer Jesper Nodin's piece to deconstruct. They had performed it, actually premiered it, but to really see what could happen. You know, if you are musicians or you're familiar with orchestras, you know that there are ways you are communicating, you are rehearsing, you are working. And what happens when you bring in elements of improvisation and also you have to find ways of working together. Uh, and how can we expand the existing ways of working when we are bringing in technology? So that is really what we're interested in. Not only uh, using technology, but actually using it for expanding the artistic role and expanding the arts itself. So here you can see another piece. It's actually the score by Rosanna Gunnarsson, a piece which we commissioned for our ensemble. Uh, which um, have been like four iPads. And in below you can see the sample app, which is one of the main apps they are using because you can manipulate the sound in so many ways. You can record, you can live sample, and you can do ways of how you deal with it. 
And this photo is from uh, a commission we did last year together with the Helsingborg Symphony Orchestra and the Gagego Ensemble. The Gagego Ensemble in Sweden is one of the most advanced contemporary music ensembles. So here in this photo, you can see the string section from the Symphony Orchestra, and on that side, you can see the musicians from uh, Gagego. In the middle, you see two of our musicians from Elefantara. So I often say this is the ideal picture of inclusion. Why? Not because you see a wheelchair. No, because you see everyone here has got music stands with the music, but they have audio scores instead. So uh, Hans Eko is the composer and conductor. He's got a little desk there which he's taking out and then he can activate and they, they get the score in their ears instead. So this is ways of where the technology also offers opportunity so you can actually play and work together on an equal basis. Do you get the point? So this is about how we can expand these types of work in new ways of not only uh, replacing what we have done before, but rather expanding. So we have always been interested in technology and we have also be become a place where people are coming to, uh, to um, do research. Uh, so this is a PhD student from Stanford who was working with us because she was very interested in how can we get dancers to do their own music. So she was exploring ways of how to develop new interfaces using vibrations, etc. Uh, this is uh, from another lab we did with Lloyd May, who's coming next week actually to conduct a new lab. He's now a PhD student at Stanford. At this time, we're using a MIMO lab, which Imogen Heap was inventing. Um, and you can see a, a black bracelet over there. Uh, it's actually a bracelet where Peter here on the, uh, on the screen, he can actually think, uh, but he cannot use his hand properly. So what he's thinking is giving the energy so it's actually using that energy which is going through the body and the uh, bracelet will pick up that so he can use the hand for playing. Unfortunately, the US Army was very interested in this technology as well. So it's not possible to use for us anymore or anyone else. This is the tricky thing with these kind of technology. It's not, uh, so I often say, well, it's the Army and us who are interested in this. So this is another uh, thing we are doing a lot right now. We are developing a remote performance platform for co-creating music online. Uh, this is from a session we had last autumn. You see Hannah, our musician. She's in the um, art center in South Sweden. And on the screen you see other musicians and they are placed in two, three, four other locations. Why? Because we are using JackTrip, a technology which, which is reducing uh, latency. So it's actually possible to play together. But what happens when we are together in a digital environment? Well, it creates a lot of other issues. We are lacking the emotions we have together in the room. Here we are expanding emotions when we're sitting here together. But you're not, you're not actually exchanging that in the same way. So we are working with a company called X System, uh, who has developed um, a musical model of a brain, so you can predict to 99% what the brain is actually going to tell you. So we're using that one now to connect together, working together with Stanford, um, and also using an AI agent for creating music. So with the feelings, we can actually use the bio data for creating music, but also to exchange. How are you feeling? Can you communicate? And of course, that also opens up for people who are not able to communicate verbally. So here is from uh, last spring, we were working together with a PhD student, Barbara Nernes, who's very interested in biodata. So in this concert, we had our musicians in Gothenburg uh, and in Stockholm. And you can see even there, she's wearing a hat. So she's actually sonific. Uh, she's uh, using the brain waves and we are playing. She's playing on her own brain waves. And then we had Ewell, uh, who was actually playing using the heart rate. Uh, he had to run a little bit to get the pulse up. And then uh, Barbara has been developing a stethophone instead of a stethoscope. And then he sampled his life, sampled his heart, and used that in the piece. You can listen to the pieces online. 
We are right now uh, developing this remote performance platform uh, within the Horizon funded project MuseIT, which you can check out. It's a, a project where we are exploring multimodality and how we can um, preserve and also develop the, uh, our cultural heritage. Uh, and we have to remember we are creating new cultural heritage today through Born Digital. So I think I'm running out of time. So I would like to say you should follow the development. Uh, I will be around if you have more questions and please uh, keep in contact. Thank you, Sophia. It's very in interesting. We will continue with Sophia soon. So she will be yes, at the stage. You still can leave some comments if you want and opinions to the Mendy for Sofia and our next specialist. Our next specialist is Tunde Olatunji. Olatunji's work focuses on the intersection of placemaking, arts and AI. His training as a film producer underpins his belief that stories are central to most compelling experiences. He is currently the co-founder and CEO of Arts Arcade, a startup with a mission to become the operating system of urban, urban culture for young people in London. Welcome, Tunde. Hi, morning, everyone. I'm feeling slightly unwell. I, I think I had food poison, poisoning last night, so apologies if I'm uh, not. Normally, I'd be on an energy scale from one to 10, about an 11, but today I'm probably closer to a seven, I'm afraid, so. Um, okay, that's great, thank you. Right, so, challenges with creating sustainable. By the way, firstly, um, it's nice to be called an expert for something, that's never happened before, so my. <laughs> My, my daughter and friends would be absolutely stunned that I've come to a place where that happened. So thank you for that. If nothing else, it was worth the travel just for that alone. Right, so very briefly, I'm a computer scientist, uh, generative AI. I'm not gonna talk about any tech whatsoever. Uh, mostly I'm gonna focus just on human-centered things and sustainable culture. What I'm also gonna do is my talk in two parts. Part one is what Arts Arcade is, and part two is how we try to create sustainable change in London. Um, and I will also try and address a few of the themes that came up in yesterday's keynote, of which I'll just repeat in case anyone um, wasn't able to remember it, that one, platforms and the attention economy is here to stay. Two, that authenticity produced the right way sells. And the third one is that creativity takes many forms, some of them are sustainable. Uh, and I'll come on to a talk about why that is. I'm mostly going to focus on authenticity and sustainable creativity. And for now, as maybe a working definition, because I think we use the word sustainability a lot and it means different things in different contexts, for this particular talk, I'm going to take it to mean something along the lines of sustainable art and culture in terms of a positive or desired change that lasts. And that last is actually the key point here, right? In terms of you know the kinds of things that we want to do. So what is Arts Arcade? So that very briefly, I won't run through it all, but effectively, we are trying to do what we call an operating system of urban culture. Why an operating system? Operating systems are interesting because you don't need to design everything that they will do. You put the building blocks there and then it allows a lot of other things to take place. And we would argue that's important for sustainability because we don't need to think about every potential outcome. We want to actually operate as a platform so that a lot of different things can happen because we really have no idea what's going to work long term or not. Right. And so therefore it's about what's sometimes called an architecture of participation, where you make things easy for people to build, to test, to reiterate, those kinds of things. And then the final part, and this is critical for us, is that we believe everybody is an artist. They just may not have had the training yet, and that's why they come to us, or at least that's, that's our goal. And what does the right training mean? And for us, it means probably three things. That it's urban art that young people already enjoy, we're not gonna try to get somebody who's not interested in a thing to do something. That, that we would argue for us is not useful. We should take the things that they already like doing. Technology only where it's appropriate. Again, even though I'm a tech guy, we're not gonna use tech just for the hell of it, only where it makes sense. And then the final part is all levels of participation. 
So we don't go as far at the moment because we're a startup as Sophia is, that's where we want to get to, where you actually have a system that just everybody can take part. We're definitely not there yet, but that's, that's the North Star, that's the goal. And then the key measure ultimately for us is, do people actually want to come back the next day? It's really simple. If they come in and they don't want to come back, we've done something wrong. Um, so that's the thing that we would focus on. That's a sense of, I guess, the structure that we have. So this is the idea of the OS. And it really, it's about physical and then, you know, AR, metaverse, which I know um, we talked about this morning, uh, Andrew, and a generative AI platform. The key thing there, quite frankly, is actually the physical, the one on the left. For reasons I'll come on to, but the most important reason is this. If we are focused too much on the digital, and the average person, I think, checks their phone 150 times a day, is three and a half hours on their device, Ultimately, we're trying to do something that TikTok, Meta, a whole bunch of other companies can already do. Complete waste of time for us. What we should be doing instead is saying, when you're in the room and you're co-located, what's our experience then? Because we would argue for 16 to 25 year olds, that's the most important thing, not what they can do on a phone. So for us, that's the most important part of our platform. And ultimately, if we were doing what we did successfully, you could take most of the rest of it away. Commercially, I wouldn't want to because I think that would be a problem, but the physical side and the human interaction is the key. And this is a sense, again, of just the building blocks that we have. Um, again, won't go through everything, but ostensibly we concentrate on everything from music to gaming to dance, sport, fashion, art, etc. It's reasonably wide. The easiest way to think about these maybe is through a really urban lens. So um, we work with the world's best break dancers. We work with the world's best body poppers. We work with graffiti artists. Um, MCs we will work with, you know, people who will sell out Wembley Stadium next year. So the idea is that we're working at the excellence end with people who are world class that everybody will have heard of in their field. Then we have growth and participate and participate is the thing that everybody can do and they can just come and experience a program across all of these categories. But really the critical thing for us actually with the categories is that the ones at the bottom are the cross cutting themes. They are actually the most important. Uh, sustainable design, computational thinking. We're not trying to create programmers, but we want, we believe it's important that young people would have a sense of how these black box models work at a high level, just some kind of sense, because that's the world they're going to inhabit, or they already do, like it or not. Financial literacy is really critical for us, and we'd argue that's a key component of sustainability. The United Kingdom, for instance, has some of the lowest rates of financial literacy in the OECD. They're shocking. Um, that affects all kinds of life decisions that are suboptimal because of that alone. That's a really important area for us. And then the final one is well-being. Uh, a couple of our founder members of our team, one is a neurologist, one is a neuroscientist. Uh, it's important that we, at the very least, make sure that we don't make people worse off. That's the very minimum we have to do. And of course, ideally, you should get, help people to become better off. That's really key. So ultimately, this stuff over at the top is important, yes, but it's the ones at the bottom. And we would argue that those ones at the bottom are critical for what we would describe as a 21st century artist. And again, if we go back to our, our kind of mission, we believe everybody is an artist. You come through the door, you're an artist. That's our job. And the question was asked yesterday about what is the role of humans? We would have a very simple answer, and it's, it's not maybe there's lots of different ones, which is to become artists, right? We're artists. We're at least artists of our own story, our own journey through this life. And, you know, that's our goal. So how do we achieve all of this? Because that's Arts Arcade, and it's a big mission and all the rest of it, but how do we actually go about doing it, which is the, you know, the hard part? The first part is partnering. We definitely, as a startup, and even if we had unlimited resources, nearly could not achieve all of this by ourselves, so partnerships are important. In a sustainability sense, partnerships are also important because you don't have to waste resource trying to do something that may already have been achieved or that you could leverage somebody else's assets. We work the Crown Estate, and just very briefly, for those of you who haven't heard of them, the Crown Estate own Regent Street, which is the longest commercial street in London, one of the longest in Europe, two kilometers. They own the entirety of the UK seabed, which is 12,600 kilometers roughly, the fourth largest in the world. And they own a large part of St. James's. Um, and they've owned that since about the 1750s. What they are there to do is to do this for the benefit of the United Kingdom as a whole. So even though it's kind of in, it's held in trust by King Charles III, but it's actually for the nation as a whole. And their goal is to transform London. And that's why for us, they're a great partner. And effectively their vision, and this is their London vision, is, and there are a couple of things that are important, welcoming and accessible. For those of you who haven't been, Londoners are exceptionally friendly. Andrew would confirm they're some of the friendliest people you'll meet in the UK, more or less, except Manchester maybe, but no. But welcoming and accessible is one of the key things. And that means welcoming and accessible for everybody. At the moment, 
London is shocking in terms of disability and accessibility. It really isn't good. And the Crown Estate would say that if they were here. That's a thing that has to improve um, in order, because otherwise you really can't be welcome and accessible. Leading on urban sustainability, I think, again, it would be true to say that London's not there at the moment, but that's the aspiration or the goal. And then the final part is really um, creating distinct thriving destinations. And that's the part that I'll talk about a little bit more now in terms of the destination that we're working on. And there's a big opportunity, right? As much as these things are challenges, they're also fantastic opportunities. Um, this area that you see there to the right, that's part of where we will work. But the key things I'd focus on briefly are that because of our partnership with the Crown Estate, they have the opportunity to curate a district. And I'll talk briefly about that, what that is in a moment. And also create smart destinations. And again, it's using art and culture to enhance uh, the city. So districts, not buildings. All that means essentially is that when you own a collection of buildings and they're all linked as the Crown Estate do, instead of just having a shop here, a cafe there, another thing over there, which, which in a sense from a customer point of view makes no real sense, there's no experience, you can actually curate an area. So the idea now is that you move towards curating districts. So the part that we're working in should serve as a pilot for having an entertainment and culture zone. Oh, sorry, so, uh, yeah, thank you. Should operate as having a culture zone. That's the idea so that you go into Piccadilly and Haymarket and there are cultural activities, there are artistic activities and you know that that's a zone for that. In another zone, there'll be a different thing. London doesn't at the moment have that, but the view is that this is where the city needs to change. And again, for those of you that are not familiar with London, um, Piccadilly is right in the geographic center. Um, where we operate is just at the end of Regent Street, which I'll come on to explain at the moment. But the idea is briefly that this whole part of London around here becomes in time an entertainment district. It's not there at the moment, the buildings need a lot of work, but that's the big vision that the Crown Estate and ourselves have. And this briefly, as I wrap up towards the end, this is where we're based at Arts Arcade. So we have two floors. Uh, we are come out of Piccadilly Circus, turn left, and it's probably from here to the end of the uh, room. That's where we are. And it, it's about a thousand square meters, which is a reasonable bit of size. And that's the Eros statue. So we're right overlooking it. What it means is that we have an opportunity to be highly visible, but equally a pressure not to mess up. Because actually, I had started this project some years ago in Swansea, where we had no people that wasn't sustainable in terms of the amount of people coming. Transferred it to London, has a challenge now that we have a lot of people, so hopefully we can make it culturally sustainable, economically sustainable. But of course, the challenge is you're highly visible. So if it doesn't work, everybody gets to see your failure. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Tunde. You can have this microphone. There you go. And then we're going to have Sophia. And this one is for you. Okay, thank you. It's very inspiring. It's very good. Thank you. Uh, what do you think about the social aspects? How important is, is it is to, to grow or uh, to keep it very uh, livable when we think about sustainability? What do you think? Is it, is it important? What a strange question. <laughs> What a strange answer and good answer. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Ma. No, I, I think the uh, the social aspect is of course key. Mm. That's why I mean it. it's a strange yeah. question because I, I think somehow we in the art sector we are very much oh oh arts for the arts sake. I don't know here in Finland if you have this debate. We have a mm. lot in Sweden, uh, and is is a kind of uh, a frightness of that we should lose something artistically. But why should the art sector stand outside the societal uh, development? Uh, for me, it's like, yes, we need to think the social, we need to think uh, the society development, and then it's part, we are all social. So yes, I think when we talk about sustainability, it's very important when we come back to the agenda 2030 to actually talk about it's a financial, economic uh, sustainability, it's a social, and it's the environmental. And we mm. have a history of only thinking that sustainability is a kind of a green pathway. Mm. That's good. And I think why I ask it, I think that we are living in some sort of individual time. 
that everything is happening like I want to do that and I want to I want to be in social media I want to I want to be something and uh, we all we are somehow uh, lost in the social aspects of being like real connection with the humans yeah, connecting to people yeah. connected people mm -hmm. yeah what do you think Tinda? Uh, I guess there's a number of My tech mojo is failing in people. Try it now. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Seems to be working right, fine. Um, I guess there are a number of ways of looking at it, but just picking up on what uh, Sophia was saying, there's a, so the economic part is, is critical. So if I think of our project specifically, um, there's a social dimension which is bringing different groups into that part of London who at the moment never go into there. And mostly it's Londoners, to be quite frank, because it's only full of tourists. Um, mm. So there's that kind of social aspect. But then the economic aspect is really critical. What the Crown Estate would like at Westminster Council is that the young people come pick up skills and it's economically beneficial for them. So it's this idea of art as a catalyst for economic development to some extent. And I guess I think of it as art for life's sake, right? As you said, it, it's baked in, but there's always, there's potentially a tension, isn't there, between artistic freedom and these things that you want young people to do and having to justify, but now they've got these jobs and the economics behind it. And that, you know, it, it's, it doesn't always sit comfortably. Mm. But our goal, I suppose, is to try to balance, balance the two. But to, to address your question, I guess that the social versus individual, I think there's always that tension between the two. Because if I think about personalization, and let's, like AI very briefly, and I promise I won't talk much about AI, but one of the things it offers potentially the promise is deep personalization. Like you can have what you like. Everybody here uses, you know, something like GPT and gets exactly what they want. At some level for some individuals, that's really, really beneficial. But it's different from a shared social experience, maybe. Mm. And and so, at least in the technical terms, there's potentially a tension between those two things in terms of where technology might be going and, and where social experiences are going. Mm. That's a good one. Uh, I'm picking up a few quest a few questions from the Nandi Matter. How big are your organizations? How many people are working there with you? How do you how do you which kind of your organization are? Should I start? Yeah, you can do so that. So we are ten people working in, at the core in three offices in Sweden. And then we have a big network of artists and other people who are working. So during a year, we might be 50 people working. It really varies depending on what we're doing. Um, so, I mean, we, we have a lot of people coming in doing different projects, like our ensembles. We have a dance ensemble, several uh, music ensembles. And then we have people coming in to do different types of work, really. Mm. Yeah, but we work all over Sweden and internationally, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about you? Uh, we have a core team of about eight at the moment, and then we will increase that when we start to run the programs. We, uh, what I should have said is we're going to start in earnest in January mm. uh, next year, and then we will scale that up with other people as we need them. So yeah. quite small, and we're a private limited company, so we're for a profit company as well, so we have to make sure we make some money. Yeah, but what about the participations? How many, uh, how many people you have in-house during the year? Or during the month, it or varies. All together. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. This year we have so many activities. Um, I mean, I, I'm just coming from one lab where we had uh, musicians and dancers employed. Next week we have uh, both uh, our musicians are working in one lab. Mm. Our dancers are working in one performance. So it it really goes up and down. So mm. probably we have been more than fifty people this year in total working but they are not working all the time yeah yeah uh, probably something similar we haven't in a sense we have because we haven't started our programs yet then i don't know but i would imagine it would certainly be you know in the height in the reasonable dozens because of the amount of programs we need to to reach we need to reach you know thousands of young londoners so we're going to need a lot of people to help us do that mm. yeah uh, i'm wondering uh when we are in a seminar like this and people are maybe thinking okay i would like to do something like that uh, where to t where to start? How to start? You mean in general, doing yeah, a project, or in general, on in your perspective? Um, I think collaboration is key, and transdisciplinary uh, mm. collaboration as well. Not only seeking partners within where you are, but I think that that has been really uh, something for us. We have been never sort of. 
only relying our own resources. Uh, we get funding from the regions or from the municipality, lots of project funding, of course, as well. But during the years, that has been very, very key to work. And we, because of the mission we have, we work with different stakeholders. And I think maybe if you start something, go outside the box to think about. I think some of the um, most interesting projects have been those where we have been able to work with people which are outside our own sphere. And we have also discovered people like to meet other people. You come with the same um, solutions you want to solve or the same idea, but you come, you're bringing in your own perspectives. And people are seeking these type of meeting places today. So I would really encourage you to, uh, to go into that field. Try to find partners where you don't expect them to be. Mm. Yeah, and picking up on that, I'd say it's that, and also being really bold, to be honest. Like if I, so when I moved to London, it was to study planning and architecture originally, and I used to think when I walked along Regent Street, for some reason, I don't know why I hate shopping, but I quite like going into shops, just seeing the structure and things, and thinking maybe one day I'll have a shop along here. Um, you know, and then obviously you think that's just nonsense, I'm not going to do that at all. Um, and when I walk past the space of the building, like we have two floors, the other four floors are empty, and figure that, okay, this is a building that we're resident in, the people who own it like what we're doing. Whenever, whenever any of my business associates come, they're always flabbergasted. Firstly, they always think I'm amazingly rich because they see it, and the building would obviously be really expensive, so in their heads, they think, okay, Tunde's really rich. And I try to <laughs> say to them, if I was as rich as you all think I am, <laughs> I would be delighted, but I'm definitely not. But what you realize is that you can go to someone like the Crown Estate, who has a portfolio worth 16.8 billion, talk to them about this crazy idea combining you know, hip hop and tech and this kind of stuff. And actually they found a space and said, oh yeah, look, you can work with this. I mean, we have to pay for it at some point, but if I had been asked a year ago, would I have thought that's possible? The answer would have been no, that's nonsense. Why would they do that? It makes no sense. Um, and that actually, as, as Toby said, you can actually go to these places and partner and some of the time you'll find that they're genuinely interested and want to do something. And so you have to be prepared to be bold enough to say, I don't just maybe want, if your thing requires a big space, mm -hmm. then actually go for a big space. Don't go for a tiny one maybe, and try and speak to some people who have the right kind of spaces. Mm. We have a good question in Mendy. What is the core challenge for you to develop your organizations further and reach true impact? This true impact is a very in, uh, interesting word, like how, how you can measure the true impact. Maybe you have some sort of ideas about that. I think this is a key question because a lot of funders are asking for new types of evaluation mm. right now. And there's a lot about impact. We have been looking into the harvesting uh, method, which is about that you also try to create a better baseline for what, where are you starting, but also to be able to collect what you don't expect to happen. Because in so many projects we are writing, are we supposed to say what is going to happen? And then there are a lot of other things happening. Um, I think we all all have that kind of experience. So about harvesting is really trying to uh, to connect to people where you can draw out things which are happening and put them on the agenda. So there are new methods, and I think that needs to be expanded. Um, so you you get an awareness about that there are things which might be considering really well. And of course, we need to have a you know consistent uh, discussion around what is impact, uh, what type of impact is important mm. to show. Yeah. So we have a whole bunch of measures with something called the Thrive in Cities um, framework, which is developed by Bristol University, um, and that's part of our agreement with the Crown Estate. So that's the primary way that we would measure impact within the project. Uh, and then, as a startup, to be quite you know blunt about it, really. It's survival as well, right? Because, and, and this was, I suppose, the point earlier about if you're economically really struggling with an organization, it's very hard to have any kind of impact. So for us, it will definitely need to be financing enough that you know we can run for five, seven, ten years, however long is required, and make enough of a return that we can continue doing it. And then there's a whole bunch of KPIs for each of the programs. Mm. Can I add to that as well? Yes. Because I think because we work in so long, we can also see uh, it takes time. So we. For example, we are really encouraging trying to see that we will get, I mean, our main mission is really that we should have more disabled artists, leaders, and, uh, you know, in, in the art sphere. But you don't get that over one day. So what we are seeing right now is, you know, it's emerging people who have been taking part in our work for like the last 10 years. So sometimes you have to wait to see what is happening. 
But of course, it's like also the stories, what is happening with people. I think we need to talk more about people in this aspect. What is happening with people? Mm. How, how, how do we exchange what is happening with people? You know, and, and to share those kind of experiences as well. Mm. Yeah. Uh, can you roll a little bit uh, down? We get a one. Uh, yeah, uh, there's a question about, do you find the relationship between ecological and cultural and social sustainability? And I want to reform this question like, what kind of relationship you can see between ecological, cultural and social sustainability? Because I think that it's uh, sustainability is not just the one sustainability there and another one here. I think there is some sort of... Is it now I should talk about new European barrows? You can do it now. <laughs> okay. So I don't know if you all are familiar with uh, the Green Deal, which the EU has, and also with the new European Bauhaus, um, which is the initiative Ursula von der Leyen has created. And we have become um, uh, NAB partners. And for us, that has been essential because we, has, as I said before, with the sustainable cities, etc., in the global goals, we have seen that how can we merge all these things together? Uh, you have to look for new ways and new tools. And there is one very good tool, which is within the uh, new European powers, which is the NEB Compass. Just Google NEB Compass and you will get it. Because there are keywords in the new European Bauhaus and you can all become members as long as you're not municipalities or regions, then you can become friends. I don't know what the network looks like in Finland. In Sweden, it's quite diverse. Uh, um, and it's that kind of transdisciplinary where you actually come you know, some are experts or more working with like the um, ecologi ecological part and some are more working with a social aspect. So I think that is also one thing, you know, to be part in these kind of networks where you're coming in and working from different perspectives, but with the same um, topic. Mm. What do you think, Nunda? Uh, I think a number of ways. I think that for us it's important where we can to go back to the thing of authenticity, to map those three things uh, into an area where it makes sense. So to give an example, if I think of sneaker culture, which is going to be central to what we do because of break dancing, b-boying, you know, street dance, et cetera, and hip hop culture generally, and the impact that streetwear has in terms of an ecological footprint, thinking of the fashion business, there's a way for us to think about working with companies like Adidas, right, with their Parlay for the Oceans, where they're doing a whole bunch of stuff in terms of reusable plastic with trainers, that those are things that could make sense for the 16 to 25 year olds to do, um, given that they have an interest at least in sneaker culture, they have an interest in the brand, and the brand is already at least doing some work to kind of alleviate some of the damage that it does. So I think one of the things that we will certainly look to do is to say where is the authenticity within the cultures that we're connected to that could link those things? That's stage one. And stage two is where you might be able to try to shift it. So again, to give a brief example, if I think of rap music, which I love, in the beginnings, it was all about social justice, right, in the US particularly. And now at a certain level, and I probably sound like an old person here in a sense, an old man, but it's quite shocking when I think how hyper-capitalist it is, really quite shocking. And that if we were to look back in 40 years time and imagine that this culture that started being about social justice says nothing about the biggest catastrophe that the earth is facing, that would be really strange because that social justice argument is really central to the climate emergency. And yet most mainstream, you know, rap music, grime, hip hop, whatever, doesn't even talk about it. So I think there's opportunities for us to work with emerging artists and think about how these things, because they will be central to the lives of the young people that these artists are after. So I think for us, as I said, it's about probably a content inside out approach to see where we can kind of find these links. Mm. Let's talk about the future. One of the favorite topics. Um, I think it's a crucial moment to think about the sustainability and to create this kind of uh, structures you are just doing and you're creating and you're supporting. Um, what do you think, um, if you can choose another way, what might be the another way for the future if you wouldn't do this kind of job you are doing? Is this a weird question again? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question, but it reminds me of that we have not so much been talking about one thing which is essential for our work, which is mm. co-creation. Mm. Because our work has been um, based on that, and I don't think we had even words for that when we started working. 
mm. uh, which is quite interesting. And I think uh, for me personally, <coughs> as also as an artistic director, it's very interesting that co-creation can take place in so many different ways. It's just not one way of doing it. And I think this, this is maybe for the future to look into those type of work methods we can develop and investigate. So I think that kind of curiosity is important. It's not about finding the right way, but having that type of curiosity, trying to not stop developing new things. Mm. Um, so yes, of course, there are many other ways we could do it, uh, but I, I just want to point out is we are not working with just one way of working. It's, uh, it's also about um, making sure that the, the kind of work we are doing can evolve in different ways, and you're trying to to learn and and to push new things. And I did see a question early on: Do the orchestras do they want you, or do they <laughs> do we have to persuade them? I, I think, like both, yes, there are, there are many who are interested in, and it is you know how do you do this kind of work? Mm. Um, there are some bold people out there who say, yes, we need to do this. If, I think those things who are very strict, it's very hard to change. And I think that's in general, those things who are very strict, it's hard to change. But we need to maybe have a little bit more of boldness and, and be prepared for that. We don't know what is going to happen, but we need to do things and we need to try out and we need to have platforms for trying out. Yeah. That is important. Yeah. Not always think production results. Yeah. Do you think, don't they about Sophia's idea? So the question, so what else if it wasn't <laughs> Arts Arcade? Yeah. Um, actually, I, I think I have an answer, I, which is what I may do post Arts Arcade if it's successful, which is the uh, forestry. So initially, many years back, that's what I was going to study. And so I would be doing forestry in Nigeria. That's actually what long, long, long term I will probably still want to do at some point. Mm. And, and by that, all I mean is um, taking secondary forests that are disturbed and not in a great condition and actually, you know, restoring them. Fast growing trees, melaina is probably one of the best species. Doing something like that, you know, capturing carbon, et cetera, um, using that to also develop farmer livelihoods, that kind of thing. Mm. So that will be the long term thing. Yeah, that's what I will do. Yeah. And what about co-creation? Co what do you think about it? The co-creation point, so with respect to Arts Arcade, uh, I would say also that's critical. It, it's interesting for us, I think we're slightly more top-down at the moment, if I'm honest, because, and part of that's also to do with the funding structure, that we need to structure things. So so part of our plan is we have three tiers. So one tier is we work with world-class artists that, you know, because that draws the brands in and et cetera, et cetera. So that part tends to be less co-created in a sense. But then we need to set up the infrastructure such that mm. we co-create. And ultimately, I probably have in my mind a vision of success where when I come in, go up the escalators, see a group of people doing something. If somebody were to ask me what's going on, I think a delightful answer would be, I have no idea. But they seem like they're engaged and they're doing something. Hopefully it's a good thing. I don't have to kind of get too involved. That for me would be success because at that point, it's way, way, way beyond what you know I think or the core team think. It's just a group of people there that are you know, doing something that hopefully is benefiting them. And we don't have to be kind of all over the micro details. So that's the kind of co-creation I'd like in time. Mm. Yeah. And I suppose we we shouldn't be needed. Yeah. Mm. Mm? That is another way of thinking. Yeah. Mm? That's a good one. Uh, we are almost running out of time, not yet. We have many minutes left, so <laughs> don't be hurry. Uh, what is the last thing you want to say as I summarize this morning case session? What is the last idea for the audience do you want to leave i have one if i can go first be ambitious like be really ambitious and bold because the truth of it is if we figure you know so one view which i understand is it you know we're heading towards a cliff and hell in a handbasket etc this kind of thing right um hopefully a it's not as bad as that but b, be really ambitious to some extent because the changes that we're all talking about needing to happen in the world aren't going to happen with there's lots of things we can all do that are small of course but it's also okay to think big and say, okay, what can we do? Because collectively, people will respond. Right? Things can start with really tiny movements that don't seem like a big deal at all. And you know, you look back and say, wow, I've got all these people involved in this thing and we're making some real change. But be ambitious, be bold, you know, dare to be brave. Mm, dare to be brave, that's a good one. What about Sophia? People want to create change. You just need to uh, provide that opportunity. And 
I also, because we are working with a group, we have disabled people in the perspective. I think I also want to say, do remember that. And what does that mean in the kind of work you're doing? So we should, we should really consider, is everyone part of the work we are doing? It might be disabled people, it might be other groups. So, um, and then uh, what we didn't get time to talk about, social innovation. Yeah. Uh, there are so many wordings around this kind of field, but I think it's about creating that aspect that we can all be part of a change which is needed. And that we as an arts and culture sector, whatever we are representing in here, we can contribute. So I think, you know, we can all do things. We oh. just need to find the pathway we can do. So yeah, go ahead. Oh. It's a very good quest, uh, qu very good uh, conversation. Uh, I want to thank you for this inspirational moment. And uh, dear audience, remember, Dunda and Sofia will stay here for today. So if you have anything on your mind, please take find your moment with them. They're very, very inspirational person. Uh, and there's lots of things we couldn't, we didn't have time, but we will continue this conversation later. But now, applause. Thank you. <laughs>